Live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will, I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly uh, their original air date, who wrote the, the, uh, the screenplay, and who uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. In this video, we're going to talk about the episode All Our Yesterdays. Um, so in this episode, the Enterprise arrives at a planet called Sarpadian. Uh, their sun is about to go nova, and the Enterprise is basically like, we've got to, you know, figure out what's uh, what's going on with the population here, if we can save them, etc., etc. They find only one resident of this planet still there, Mr. Atos, who is the librarian. Uh, this is a library not of books, but of sort of viewing discs, small viewing discs. And the viewing discs depict, as uh, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy come to find out, periods of this planet's history, which seems to look pretty much exactly like Earth's history, conveniently enough. Uh, they, are, they are looking at these some of these discs, when Kirk hears a woman scream, so he runs through what he thinks is the doorway, and it turns out it was a portal to the time period that he had been looking at on this disc. Um, this is a sort of 1600s Europe type period. Um, maybe around the sort of early part of the reign of, of uh, Louis the Fourteenth in France, something like that, Louis XIII maybe, somewhere in there. Um, English Civil War era. Um, Kirk, because he can talk through the portal to Spock and McCoy, uh, is taken for a witch. He gets arrested for this, uh, Kirk and uh, Spock and McCoy attempt to go through the portal to rescue him, but because they were looking at a different disc, they end up in the planet's Ice Age 5,000 years earlier, uh, which is not where Kirk is. So Kirk has to sort of figure out how to get back. Um, Spock and McCoy have to figure out how to get back, but first they have to find some shelter because it's the Ice Age and they're going to freeze to death. Um, and they get sort of taken in by this woman named Zarabeth, who was uh, sent to the Ice Age basically as a prisoner. Um, she, she was exiled there by the former leader of the, uh, of the planet, uh, Zarpadian, Zarpadian, sorry, um, and basically, uh, 
he is trapped in the past forever because of a particular machine called the Atavacron, which prepares your biological structure to live in that time period. Now, the problem is, uh, so the two problems with this, one, from the perspective of trying to get back, is that if you have been processed by the Atavacron, you cannot go back. You will die in transit through the portal. However, if you have not been processed through the Atavacron, like Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, uh, you will die within a few hours of getting to the past, because your cell structure and biology and whatever it is are set up for the future, not for the past. And apparently, this is a big issue. Um, the prosecutor who is going to prosecute Kirk for witchcraft is apparently himself a time traveler from the future. He has come back. This was the era he chose uh, to live in. Uh, in order to escape the supernova. And when Kirk's like, I wasn't processed by the Atavacron, the prosecutor's like, well, fuck, you need to go back. We need to get you out of this jail. We need to get you to the portal. Go find your friends, get them back as well, because you're all going to die. Meanwhile, Zarabeth has not exactly lied to Spock, but has given him information in such a way that he would draw the wrong conclusion. Um, she has said that the Atavacron processes your cells so that you can't go back. Which is true. What she doesn't say is that the Atavacron is not the same thing as the time portal. And so going through the time portal does not alter your cells. So Spock and McCoy can go back, but she leaves that part out so that Spock will want to stay with her. Spock accepts this and starts, he basically from the moment they get there becomes progressively more and more emotional. He eats meat, which he normally doesn't do. Spock is a, a vegan, I suppose. Vegetarian, at least. Um, as are all Vulcans, it seems. Um, but he becomes progressively more and more hostile, <clears throat> to McCoy especially. Uh, he is not 100% clear that he has sex with Zarabeth, but he probably does. Um, at the very least, he makes out with her. Probably they have sex. Because, you know, they're adults. Whatever. Um, Spock is not Spocking. He's not doing the stuff that is characteristic of him as a Vulcan. And McCoy works this out. He works out that because they are 5,000 years in the past and they've not properly been processed, Spock is reverting to his ancestors of 5,000 years in the past. That is, Vulcan's savage, distant past, prior to the embrace of logic and peace and vegetarianism and all this stuff. Uh, interestingly enough, McCoy does not seem to be reverting to humanity's ancestors from 5,000 years in the past. Um... So, you know, that's that. But, um, eventually McCoy does sort of get Zarabeth to, to confirm his hypothesis that they can go back, and in fact that they need to go back because their cell structures are not set up for this time period. Kirk, for his part, with the prosecutor's help, does get back through the portal. Um, so he's back in the library. Mr. Atos is like, ah, oh, you've got to go. You've got to get off this planet because it's going to, the sun's going to nova. And so he's trying to, like, shove Kirk back through the time portal, and Kirk's basically fighting him to, to try and find the right disc uh, where uh, McCoy and, and Spock had gone to. Eventually, McCoy is like, you know what? Fuck this noise. I'm going to go find this portal myself. Spock, you can stay here if you want to. Uh Spock does actually go with him, which is good, because it turns out that because they had gone through together, uh, initially they need to come back together in order for the portal to work. 
Uh, so eventually they do this. Spock and Zarabeth have a uh, tearful parting, uh, and then they escape. Mr. Ato, a- after Spock and McCoy come back through the portal, Mr. Ato very quickly puts his own disc in, and he pieces that. Uh, Spock and McCoy feel the need to have a conversation on the planet, even though the sun is about to go Nova in literally like 12 seconds. Um, and then Kirk has them all beamed up and the Enterprise maximum warps out. So, um, there's a couple of things here that I think are, are worth talking about from a social justice perspective. Um, one is the treatment of prisoners. Because we have two prison stories here, essentially. We have Zarabeth and we have Kirk and the woman who apparently was a thief or something, accused of being a thief, not 100% clear. Um, but the woman from the, we'll call it the 1650s, um, who is also imprisoned and who accuses Kirk of, of being a witch. Um So the I think the more interesting of these storylines in terms of the ethics of, of the treatment of prisoners is Zarabeth being exiled to um, the distant past, to the Ice Age. Because this is essentially a kind of um, solitary confinement. Right? She is sent by herself. Um, the The uh, ruler who she had, not even she had crossed, her, her kinspeople had crossed. Um, her family members had, had plotted against this sort of autocratic ruler, and as punishment they were killed and she was exiled. Uh, so he exiled her with enough supplies and food and things like that that she could remain alive, but no companionship. Now, human beings are social animals, and this is actually one of the big issues in um, prison studies, um, the sort of ethics of, of the treatment of prisoners, is solitary confinement is generally regarded by people who work in the field as a form of torture. Uh, it is a form of psychological torture, Um because human beings are social animals and we require interaction with one another to remain psychologically healthy. Some people require more, some people require less, but it is a basic requirement of human psychology. And so the purposeful deprivation of human interaction is regarded today, not in 1969 when this episode came out, um, as a form of torture by many people, in particularly the prison abolition community. Um, it's, it's worth noting that to escape this essentially torture, this isolation, uh, Zarabeth is willing to, as McCoy puts it, lie, cheat, steal, even murder me, the captain, the entire crew of the Enterprise. Um, Zarabeth is willing to mislead, if not outright lie, to Spock in order to keep him there with her. And this raises its, itself another ethical issue. In the context of torture, is it ethical to lie in order to end that torture? I think most people would probably say yes, because generally speaking, I think people would say torture is unjustified in and of itself. But there was a guy named Immanuel Kant who uh, came up with a theory called the categorical imperative, short version of which is... Um, Basically, the, the short version is um, it is unethical to do anything that you would not want continually done. So Hunt takes a very strong stance against lying. He basically says it is never permissible to lie. 
because a world in which everyone lied all the time would be fundamentally unfunctional. Um, and so, so Kant has this very strong uh, perspective here. He he actually uses the example if a if a murderer comes to your home and says, "Is X person here so that I can come in and kill them?" Then you have an uh, an ethical obligation to say, "Yes, that person is here." Is Zarabeth justified in? lying slash giving the wrong impression in order to avoid her continued torture. Kant might say no. He might say this is an unethical thing that she's done. And clearly McCoy takes a similar view. Um, McCoy is not willing to remain in the Ice Age on behalf of Zarabeth so that she does not experience this torture. Uh, Spock seems more willing to, but that is also the Spock of 5,000 years earlier. The violent, meat-eating, sex-having version of himself. And so, again, it raises these sort of interesting ethical questions about extenuating circumstances, perhaps.